javelinas are the so-called wild pigs of southern Arizona, although they are not pigs at all. They are about the size of a large dog and are very destructive to gardens, flowers, cactus, landscaping, and golf courses. They eat and trample and dig everything. As part of our fencing of our property to keep the javelinas out, we installed an anti javelina electric fence along the back edge of our property line. From left to right, the electric fence was 120 feet in length. Electric fences can be installed quite quickly and usually at less expense than a true fence. Now let's look at our fence design. First we have a T-post at one end, a 5-foot T-post, another T-post in the middle, and then a third T-post at the far end. Here's our spacing of 60 feet and then 60 feet. In between the T-posts are the line posts, the fiberglass line posts, which are about 10 feet apart. And for our application, 10 inches above the ground level and then another 10 inches above that line. The red lines are your high voltage wires. The yellow insulators are shown here mounted on the T-posts. Then at the far end, we connect the two fence wires and a high voltage wire down to the fence controller. Also to the fence controller is a ground wire, which comes from two six-foot ground rods pounded into the ground along the fence line about 10 feet apart. The fence controller is housed in a weatherproof box. Here is the first T-post. This 5-foot post was pounded into the ground to a depth of about 18 inches using a pounding tool. When you pound in the post, have the bumpy side face the direction where you want to have the insulators attached. The insulators kind of hook around the post as shown in the detail. For our application, the first insulator was about 10 inches off the ground and then the upper insulator 20 inches above the ground. Here's the second T-post, and notice the clipping tool. This was used to cut back everything that was within 12 inches of electric wires, such as branches, plants, grass, cactus, and so on. And consider the wind as well, to make sure nothing is going to touch the electric wire. And now the third T-post was attached. The white arrow points to the 6-foot ground rod that was pounded into the ground. You use the fence pounding tool first and then finish with a sledgehammer. This close-up of the first ground rod shows the two inches or so that remain above the ground so you can hook up a grounding clamp and a ground wire. Following the fence line we pounded in the second ground rod about 10 feet away. We started the first electric wire by wrapping it around the insulator and then using a screwdriver in the wire spool, we walked along the path to the next T-post. We used steel wire and not aluminum wire, which might stretch. The electric wire was wrapped at the center post and then to the end post as shown here. It was wrapped tightly around the insulator and then an end length of about 12 inches was left. These wires are not an actual fence, so they can be snug, but it isn't necessary to make them super tight. This process was repeated for the second wire. Next, a long tape measure on the ground where the line posts are positioned at 10 foot intervals. Here is a line post at the 10 foot interval. You can see the various clips in the fiberglass post, so you can use it to set the heights of your wires. And if you need to change the heights, it's pretty easy to do. 
The line post was pounded into the ground and the wires were placed at our 10 inch and 20 inch positions. Be sure to buy a few extra line posts because one or more might break when pounding them into the ground with a sledgehammer. In this case we broke one of the line posts and we took an old auger drill and drilled a pilot hole in the ground and immediately upon removing the drill pounded the line post into the pilot hole. Next the ground wire was attached. Using high voltage wire for this connection you strip off the wire insulation and then attach the clamp around the ground rod and secure the wire to the clamp location. The ground wire was routed to the next clamp where insulation was stripped off the wire about one inch then doubled over and connected to the clamp. And finally the ground wire was routed to the location of where the electric fence controller will be located. Here is the splice shown by the white arrow that we use to connect the two electric wires and the high voltage wire that goes to the electric fence controller. We also put in a cable tie as a strain relief for this splice. The next images will detail this splice. Also note that we have toned down the insulator bright yellow with a fine mist of green spray paint. Painting the insulators is not recommended, but we found that the very light coat of paint did not degrade the insulator function in any way, and now the insulators blend better into the landscape. For the splice of the two electric wires and the high voltage wire, we use a standard wire crimp connector and a piece of heat shrink tubing. Here the crimping is done and we're ready to slide the heat shrink tubing over the connection and to apply heat to shrink it around the connection. Best is a heat gun like the one shown but a propane torch can be used lightly and even an open flame of some kind. Here is the finished splice. Next we mounted a waterproof box for the electric fence controller. This is a standard electrical junction box and like everything else in this project it came from Home Depot. The electric fence controller was mounted inside the weatherproof box and two small holes were drilled in the ground for the ground wire and the high voltage wire. A small groove was made by the edge of the box for the power cord. We looped the two high voltage wires around the electric fence controller to have a bit of extra wire in case something needed to be changed. Of course, be very careful that you connect the proper wire to the proper terminal on the controller. The ground wire goes to the green terminal. A rating of 0.5 joule should be the minimum for your controller. Joules are a measurement of watts per second, and while 0.5 joule doesn't sound like much, when the pulse is very short and the voltage is high, it's a pretty good non-lethal shock. Compare this to a heart defibrillator that has settings up to 360 joules. For a test, we placed this little electric fence indicator wire on the wire and plugged in the electric fence controller for the first time. We believe the controller must have a large capacitor inside that needs to charge up before the electric fence starts to operate properly at full potential because the big spark on snap from the indicator didn't appear for about 30 seconds. For our application we ran an extension cord to a GFI outlet to power the electric fence controller. There are other methods including solar and battery operation. We then did one last check before putting on the weatherproof cover. Here's the finished weatherproof box with the cover installed. All done and sensor installation, no visits from the dreaded Havelinas.